Um, okay, and and um, and you know he, he you know you know, talked often about you know how the summers would be spent on the bar and you know, just tell everybody to turn off their mics and their and mute. Just to mute your mic and, and hopefully also your video. Because we're getting feedback. And it ain't positive. It's kind of static. So if you could just mute yourself, that'd be great. Now, I was just asking Luke about uh, did he spend summers cutting turf on Gloria Bog? The strange thing is, my, from my mother's. One of the windows in my mother's house, the Lee's house. Yeah. You could see actually Sergeant McGarren with the family on the bog cutting turf. Right. And, and, and my mother remembers that vividly, you know, marshalling the family to cut the turf on the bog within, within the view of one of the side windows in my mother's house, the Lee's house. And 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 the the, McGarren, the father's piece of bog was 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 along the as you go towards um, you know Kiju or, or yeah or, as you go towards uh, Kiju and it's, on, it's on the left hand side is it as you go towards Kiju and yeah. but then you, you turn right aha uh -huh. okay so for Trumbola yeah and sure. that's where it is you turn right yeah. for john okay. would enjoy it more if you had of course yeah, but, uh, it's bigger. Uh, could we again just to remind people because we're getting to, to you. keep your you know, to mute your uh microphones because otherwise we're going to get static and i won't be able to hear on. luke more importantly uh, we all won't be able to hear luke um, anyway, I, I, I kind of feel about, uh, that it's um, uh, you know, as you as you come in the door, okay. so to speak, uh, just to welcome you and to say how great it is to be to be back again. I, I'll do the um, the formal introduction. Yeah. Um, Tom. Uh, in, in a few minutes, Peter. Yeah, Tom. i um, I was going to, once. So uh, we've got everyone in place yeah i was just going to do a bit of housekeeping or good, to, and, good. Then, uh, and then hand over to you tom okay so we'll, we'll wait until seven o'clock and yeah. then I'll, I'll just uh, say what i have to say and then i'll hand over to you okay um there's one or two people's microphones still open um i think kathleen you, your microphone doesn't appear oh, no. to be muted okay. yeah it's on the bottom left hand side kathleen that's it, Kathleen. Well yeah. done. Uh, and it, it, this isn't about naming and shaming. It's nothing. It's just about that. <laughs> some of us are. I, I was doing. I was doing a talk uh, with Mark uh, Hederman O'Brien, and uh, it was it was a keynote address. It was on Zoom, and you know uh, he came on, and they said, um, uh, uh, "Just uh, click on the link," and he said, "What's a link?" <laughs> and there was no it's it's not an it's it, it's it, it's a, an address uh, at the bottom anyway i'm very mindful of uh given um, my age uh how easy it is to um uh, uh not to be technologically savvy uh, that, and that just on that issue you might uh you know, one of the things that I remarked about it was that McGarren uh, had a, a, a and I wouldn't call it a phobia, but a dislike of modern technology. Um, and so that, you know, even learn it, and this is true, that he, he, typewriting uh, it, it was kind of alien to him. And he got his, his wife, Madeleine, to do the typewriting. I think it was only in the, the latter years that he, he managed to get involved in emails. But even then, I, I got the impression that it was not something that uh, he was at home with. Uh, is, is that your understanding, Luke? Well, it's interesting that given his reservations about writing letters, he had even more reservations about emails. Yes, yes, which, yeah. Which really put the tin hat on the whole thing. Uh, yeah. But 
I think when he went to teaching in Colgate University. Okay. The email, the yes, the digital stuff just was inescapable, and he and of course it was a great way of connecting to home as well. Right. So I think in a way he was reluctant digital. <laughs> yeah, and uh, but I I have um, friends and colleagues who still write by hand, um, and they you know and the idea of uh, you know, typing first drafts of anything. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I, I still write by hand before. Yeah, I, I, I was leading to that. I kind of suspected it, but I didn't want to say it. Yeah, I'm. I belong to the Kiju school of <laughs> digital culture. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay, but but you do you you you're able to tip type on the typewriter on the computer after a fashion after a fashion. After a fashion right. Okay. Um, it's not touch typing. Uh, no, I never mastered that either. Um, uh, but yeah, I can imagine the uh, when I was learning English, you know, things where I was no. used to say. You know, never start a sentence before you know it's how it's going to end. Uh, and I think you know the computer has uh, un undone that uh, skill. Uh, and well, I, th I think that <clears throat> I'll say more about this, but part of the subtext in I think they're just chatting before. Oh, okay, could it, okay. We, we, let's go into the um, right. Yeah. So very welcome, and here is Peter, our right. housekeeper. Well, uh, welcome and good evening. Um, I'm Peter Griffin. I just just to run through a couple of things. I suppose one of the most important things is in, in, with regard to your microphones. Um, <clears throat> if you could mute your microphones, that would be good, and um, possibly even um, stop the video as well, because that would, um, if everybody uses their cameras. Uh, broadband or broad uh, broadband uh, width broadband width uh, may be a problem. So if you could do that, um, we are recording that. Um, we are recording this. Sorry, just to say, Peter, that the the microphone is on the on the bottom left. The microphone is on the on the bottom. Now. Um, okay, we still got a number of people with their microphones on. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just, I'm just, I don't know if people can hear me, but yeah. can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, I, I just wondered if it was my microphone that was an issue. No, it doesn't seem to be. So, um, Okay, I, I can see that um, the microphones, all microphones that, that I'm looking at now, have been muted, which is good. and and that, that other uh, points I just made was more to do with uh, conserving bandwidth. If I can just add that we are recording um, this webinar for for our, our, our archive, and um, if you could keep your questions <coughs> to the end, but by all means add them to the chat room as we move along because there will be time at the end to, to answer the question. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Tom. Okay, uh, as you, uh, part of these series, which Luke is the second, we had Eamon Marr, um, and they are uh, part and parcel of uh, creating uh, a centre, uh, not just as an exhibition, but also as a kind of a reservoir of thinking and reflecting about McGarren and his writings and his contribution to our knowledge and understanding of society. And so therefore in these talks, I, I think the aim is less to get involved in crit literary criticism and more to get involved in uh, an understanding of people and place that comes through his writings. Um, and it's a particular privilege and honor uh, to have an old colleague and dear friend Luke Gibbons uh, to join us this evening. Um, uh, Luke has been a tower in the, um, in the realm of, of the Irish literary field, uh, not just a, a McGarren scholar and, and scholar of contemporary Irish, but also particularly uh, of Joyce and, and, and its ability 
uh, to um, make connections between those two writers, which I think is one of his uh, main skills. But anyway, um, he uh, has written numerous books and articles. And so therefore, the, uh, uh, it is beyond doubt that he is um, uh, suitable uh, to talk to us. But also, uh, as we were talking earlier, uh, that he grew up in Kiju, that his doctor father was the local uh, doctor in Kutol, and that his mother uh, and her family came from Kutol. So uh, he is the local embodied in the universal realm of, of literature. You're very welcome, Luke. Thanks, Tom. Before I bring up the PowerPoint, I'll show this version of the barracks, which my mother sent to my aunt Mary in Staten Island in America. And when the barracks came out, it was a source of constant exchange between people all over Coot Hall, North Roscommon. But one of the things I really like about this version of the barracks, which is semi-libelous, is a key to the characters. <laughs> <coughs> Who's who in the barracks? I, a key to the code of the characters. And question marks over... I bet this is such and such. I bet this is such and such. And as people know, there, there were some legal actions taken, or at least promised, <clears throat> um, against McGarren's fiction. So in that sense, this is why I have to keep a secret, <laughs> even for literary purposes. But it is true that my mother was a nurse in London during the war. And she came back to Goodhall after the war. And it's striking that Elizabeth Regan in the barracks comes back, comes to Cuthall after the war as well, having been a nurse in London. I mean, there would have been many more, of course, but still it, my mother had an uncanny affinity with the barracks above all the novels. And then my father, as a footballer, played with Scotland during the Ireland winning teams in the 1940s, of which McGarren was a great admirer. So I had two points of entry into McGarren's good books when I met him first. And I did meet him in 1970. I was involved in bringing him to Galway to do a public read. So in that sense, my interest goes back several decades. And what I'm going to talk about now is a kind of a set of, if you like, issues raised by McGarren's fiction. So I'm, I'm trying to bring up the PowerPoint. If Morris can... You let him screen share, Peter? This is host disabled screen sharing. If Morris can bring up the, can enable the screen sharing. Yes, here it is. So I'm taking as my point of departure, this image of John McGarren in Tokyo, which is not exactly among the locals in Leitrim. <laughs> but in one way, I'm arguing that the way he accomplishes representing the local opens it up to people in Asia as much as it does to people in Ireland. And that there's a, that there's a stylistic accomplishment involved in doing this. In a way, I would like Going back to Seamus Heaney's poem, you could compare McGarren to a water diviner who, in a sense, plums the depths of the local experience, but in a way that brings to the surface material that is even strange to local people, not just to outsiders. So I think that the, 
the fact that the writer is already to some extent an outsider in a community and pays a heavy cost for this, as McGarren did do, when local people took exception to his representation of many issues and indeed individuals, kind of barely coded in the fiction. I think this is part of the idea that it's not just outsiders who learn about a local community, it's insiders as well. So using that kind of point of departure, I'm reminded of an occasion when McGarren was asked, did he believe in heaven? And he said he wasn't so sure about such mysteries, but he knew one thing, that there were no writers in heaven. And when he was asked, how do you know that? And he says, because there's too much happiness in heaven. There's nothing to write about. And this idea that happiness and the writer is raised in a very interesting interview with Robert McCrum. What did you do? I just kicked on join audio down here. Of the observer, if people can see it on the screen. Maybe we were just wasn't just clicking yeah. first. Yeah, to join the audio, but then you have to click. Would you, would you mute your mics, please? Oh, oh, that's awesome. So McCrum is interviewing me, Garen, after the publication of the MFA Rising Sun. And McCrum brings up this thing about happiness in McGarren's work. And, and he reads out a quotation, he says, and this is a quotation and it's worth bearing with it. This is Rutledge in the Mayface Rising Sun. He felt this must be happiness, but as soon as the thought came to him, he fought it back. The very idea was as dangerous as presumptive speech. Happiness could not be sought or worried into being or even fully grasped. It should be allowed its own slow pace so that it passes unnoticed if it comes at all. So says McCrum, is that your view, he says to McGarren, about happiness? That it could that it only takes place when it's unnoticed. And McGarren says, that's exactly it. I think that complete happiness isn't possible in life. And when it happens, it's not noticed. I think people forget complete unhappiness is every bit as unachievable as complete happiness. So something is brought up by McGarren, which is going to preside over what I'm going to say. That is something about knowledge getting in the way of happiness. That if you know you're happy, you're not happy. So that Ryan, Patrick Ryan, in They May Face the Rising Sun remarks, you were in paradise and you didn't know it. It would seem the test of paradise, which is a good hint for the future, is that you don't know you're in it. Once you know you're in paradise, you're not in paradise anymore. It's interesting that the tree was a tree of knowledge, that Adam, the forbidden fruit was knowledge. So McGarren's fiction has a very complicated take on the relationship between knowledge and experience. And it's almost as if He's, the writer is trying to chart the gap that has, opens up between knowledge and experience. But what I mean by experience is all that goes without saying in local communities, the things that are taken for granted, that become part of the weather of people's lives. So in this sense, you could draw on a distinction that's made by philosophers and others, an interesting distinction between knowledge of something as against knowledge about something. And what the writer does is bring these two together. Knowledge about, in fact, is parodied in the story Strand Hill to Sea. All this information, information, information. This is the young boy talked about his father who was full of useless facts and was always trying to quiz up the young McGarren, the young boy, about kind of his knowledge of general, what we would call general knowledge. Leopold Bloom in Ulysses is the master of general knowledge, useless facts. And it could be argued that Google 
is the prime example of this in today's world. If you want information, go to Google. But if you want knowledge of something, you won't get it from the digital world. And it's almost as if literature and what we would call aesthetic form is attempting to negotiate knowledge of in relation to knowledge about and bringing them both together. It's, it's interesting that digital culture does make a brief appearance in They May Face the Rising Sun over the digital watch that refuses to, if you like, keeps blinking when the coffin is closed and that the digital culture stands for almost this. And in fact, McGarten has comments about the use of digital uh, scales in farmers markets as well. It's, it's not that that they may face the rising sun is indifferent to the digital world. It's coming on board and a few markers are put down against it. So this idea that knowledge of and knowledge about is summed up in James's comment in that they may face the rising sun. This would be knowledge of a place. You, says Jamesy with his usual wisdom. You nearly have to be born into a place to know what's going on or what to do. So knowledge of, in a sense, is inside knowledge, and, and it is what might be called the inner speech of the community. And the writer brings this out into the open and often pays a price for it because it is inner speech. It's backstage existence that communities don't like being exposed to the public in some sense. So that idea of the local is what, if you like, is at the heart of McGarren's literary endeavours. But having said along the lines of what Jamesy enunciates there, that you have to be born into a place, McGarren then puts a profound qualification to this. And that is that it doesn't follow that local people have a monopoly on what is going on. It doesn't even follow that they have privileged access or it doesn't even follow that they know the half of it, as we might say ourselves, that there's more going on, if you like, than local people themselves are aware of. And that's again where the writer comes in. Says McGarren, though there is an enormous store of experience and knowledge, psychological or otherwise, in a community, he writes, we cannot see sometimes because we are too close, too involved, so this idea that local people have a monopoly of local knowledge, McGarren says that is not true. Because if you're too close, you cannot see the big picture. And this idea that intimacy needs to be complemented by an outside perspective becomes part of how McGarren argues that the writer completes the image of a community. I don't know. If people know this, I, this, what would you call it? This kind of proverb is attributed to Confucius. I don't think he said it. Whoever discovered water, it certainly wasn't a fish. <laughs> the idea that how could a fish discover water when the fish is in water all the time and the fish doesn't, hasn't enough perspective. It's only when the fish is stranded on the beach, that the fish begins to say, oh, that's what I was in. Well, that was water. And now I miss it. And it's this idea that, if you like, too much proximity can get in the way of knowledge, just as much as too much distance can get in the way as well. In fact, says McGarren, the insider's view has its own blind spots produced by the nets of hypocrisy and lies that become as consistent as truth. So in that they may face the rising sun, there's a whole exploration of the tissues of lies and hypocrisies and deceits that local people use to cover the tracks, as it were. And again, you can see the role of the writer is to expose this. This leads to a kind of a controversial intervention on McGarren's part that has come up in various interviews and crops up again in the recent letters. 
And it's a very interesting, what you might call the limits to self-expression. Not alone would our local people not masters of all the survey. But McGarren would say even writing letters or writing journals or writing that's not aspiring to literary form is not a true voice of feeling. Says so McGarren, oddly enough, it seems to me that self-expression is almost no expression. Add in elsewhere about the circuitous artifice of truth. He says, self-expression is always bad writing. It's one of the fascinations of art that the more the material is worked into an artifice, the more true feeling is set free. This becomes, so McGarten is saying, not only do local people not have access to what's really going on around them, even when the right letters or the right journals or diaries, which most people would say is the vehicle of inner truth, McGarren says, far from it. Oscar Wilde once said, it's great to write a diary. It's handy to have something sensational to read on the train, says Oscar. Oscar would not trust a diary. He said, diaries are really self-promotion. They're not self-investigation. And, and McGarren's idea that unless the writing aspires to certain stylistic and formal accomplishments, it's not a true vehicle of feeling. Now, that's a very controversial idea. And it, it would explain McGarren's reservations about letters which crop up again and again in the recent volume of letters that Frank Shovlin has wonderfully edited. Time and again, McGarren apologizes for writing letters. And he almost says, don't trust my voice in these letters. And it's interesting that he says that because obviously he's writing the letters. And it could be argued that the early letters up to, we'll say, 1970 or thereabouts are, if you like, more unguarded than the later letters, when he began to realize that these letters may be collected. But the idea that letter writing represents simply the poverty of expression, that's, that's, a, that's a troubling idea. And I'm gonna come back to that in a short while because it does need to be examined, even though what McGarren says is very much to the point. I think this notion of circuit, if you, if you remember Emily Dickinson's phrase or line, success in circuit lies, or in, indeed Emily Dickinson also says, tell the, tell the truth, but tell it slant. So this, the, McGarren is drawing on this idea that truth never comes in a transparent form. It has to be reworked indirectly. Or in fact, truth comes through indirection rather than in direct ways. And that's where the writer steps in. Indeed, that's what Emily Nicholson herself kind of excelled at. But one of the more interesting things he says is that he, in an early letter to his sister Dempna, he says, this also applies particularly to, to war memoirs, which is an interesting kind of outtake. And I wonder, is he thinking of books like Dan Breen's Fight for Irish Freedom or Tom Barry, because he says, it's strange how people who've lived face to face with, with war hardly ever understand it outside glorification or other, dying for the faith and fatherland. McGarren says, how come that people who live, for, who live through a war don't see it for what it is, but see it through this mist or this kind of romantic haze of glory and faith and fatherland and so on. And that would be an example of people haven't experienced, but as T.S. Eliot says, missing the meaning. So people have the experience, but they miss the meaning. And the most striking, and I, I suppose the most famous example of this, is the remarkable literature that has been written about World War I and the sheer poverty of words to register the enormity of what was happening in the trenches and the horror of mechanized warfare. This led Paul Fussell, the great critic, to argue that actually almost the least reliable source of what was happening were soldiers' letters home. They had no grasp, they had no lexicon 
to grasp the horror of what was happening. And indeed, Foster goes on to argue, and others like Samuel Hines, that in fact, if you want to get the lexicon of the horror of the trenches, you have to read Ulysses. You have to read The Wasteland. Ironically, people like Joyce or Eliot <coughs> were not. <coughs> they came up with the forms to express shattered worlds. So it's no coincidence that Eliot and Joyce come up with these fragmented forms, these kind of splintered forms of language and splintered forms of narrative. Because what they were trying to do was give voice to the horror, the shattering of the senses in the trenches of World War I. Meanwhile, the poets who were experiencing it were writing Victorian verse in a very poetic artifact official diction, like Rupert Brooke or Robert Bridges. And, he, and that says fossil, that lexicon was hopelessly inadequate, dealing with daffodils and cuckoos and all this kind of stuff. So in, in a way, this argument that the writer steps in to complete experience is very much evidenced in the Great War. <laughs> But one writer, McGarren, did exempt from this, one Irish writer, and that was Ernie O'Malley. McGarren had remarkable <clears throat> things to say about O'Malley's masterpiece, Another Man's Wound. And he's, he writes to Dimna that almost until somebody could make a walk through the woods as passionately vivid as an ambush, they shouldn't be writing. And that's exactly what O'Malley does in this remarkable book on another man's wound. There are long stretches describing landscape, describing settings. It's not just a daring do along the lines of Dan Breen. It evokes the whole countryside. It evokes the fear and mm -hmm. the anxiety. So McGarren saw on another man's wound as almost the equivalent of Joyce's portrait of the artist for growing up in Ireland. O'Malley was portrait of the artist as a gunman rather than as a young man. And in that, it's no coincidence, and I just mentioned this in passing, that a whole section of O'Malley's book deals with someone from near Kutal, Patrick Morn, who was executed in 1921, and who was meant to escape from Kilmena with O'Malley, but who stayed behind because he thought they couldn't convict him of the bloody Sunday killings. He, he's, he believed in British justice to his cost because he was hanged. And there are very moving parts in another man's wound dealing with Patrick Moore, Paddy Moore, as we call him. And that comes up. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bit uncanny that Ernie O'Malley's book touches on Kutal and Krasna and indeed Kilron and Lake. So that idea that you have to make a walk through the woods as vivid as an ambush. That comes up in a very moving and strange sequence in that they may face the rising sun, which has to do with James's salutation when he enters the house and it opens up the novel and it comes, it rings like a bell <coughs> novel. every time Jamesy comes on the scene. He comes out, hello, hello, hello. And every conversation is open with, hello, hello, hello. And this kind of trite use of language is, you could take it for a cliche if you didn't realize something else was happening when he was saying this. It turns out, I suppose four fifths of the way through the novel, that hello, 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 was heard by James A. as a young boy at the Selton Hill ambush in March, 1921. And it was the half whisper he survived and he was heard shouting 
It wasn't hello, hello. I think it was help, help, help from the drain. But McGarren has him saying hello, hello, hello. And Jamesy was working in the fields with his father and they heard the shots and went over to the drain and they found Sweeney. So in fact, Jamesy has been traumatized 70 years earlier. And it's uncanny how this trauma is lodged in the language and comes up in what appears to be a cliche or a kind of kind of banter or everyday badinage. Hello, 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 James, he called out suddenly, no longer rendering the call faithfully, but, but it's very interesting, but turning it into the high cry of a bird calling out of the depths of the bog. So it's uncanny that this is brought up in the, in, if you like, the shadow of his statement to Dimpna, his sister, that unless a writer can make a walk in the woods or a walk or a, or a walk in the bog as vivid as an ambush, you have no, there's no point in writing. And this idea that James's trauma, if you want to put it, it turns out that it also brings up the limits of local knowledge. Because Rutledge, there's two or three pages spent dealing, but it's not called Selton Hill, it's called Glass Drum. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting idea that John, John McGarren changes the names of certain places and not others. Well, the closer to come to home, the more they're turned into a fictional form. And interestingly enough, Gloria Bog, late of Coot Hall, turns up in Leitrim in the Dame Face the Rising Sun, because I suppose the name you couldn't have a better name for a bog, Gloria Bog. And there's something almost haunting about it. But Rutledge says to Jamesy, have any of the martyrs any idea what really happened at Selton Hill? Still very controversial. Jamesy, not a clue. They're not from here. And the Burton Bar, Jimmy Joe's the only one who knows, and he doesn't care. So Jimmy Joe in They May Face the Rising Sun is the local IRA um, kind of, maestro or adjutant and in that sense it's kind of interesting that he says Jimmy Joe is the only one who knows and he doesn't care. What is striking is that Jamesy then comes up with something that he claims is local knowledge that the local Protestant farmer who was shot in reprisal was shot wrongly that he wasn't the informer and this is in the novel but in fact, the book I have up on the screen, Patrick McGarty's new book on Leitrim and the Irish Revolution, and the other books dealing with the Selton Hill ambush, argue that in fact, a local Protestant neighbour was the informer who tipped off the loyalist doctor in Mohill, who tipped off the military, that Sean Connolly and the brigade were at Selton Hill so it's interesting that James, he claims, even though you had first-hand experience, he claims that the local informer was not the Protestant neighbour. But again, these are in contention. That's why Rutledge says, does anyone know what really happened? It's still bitterly contested what happened at Selton Hill. But what I think is remarkable about it is that there is, in a way, a curious answer to McGarren's early critique of ordinary language. Because he said in the letter to Dimpna and the interviews I quoted earlier on, he said self-expression, ordinary language, is not the true vehicle. You have to raise it to the condition of literature, literary form. But in fact, James's use of language is charged with meaning. In fact, you could not get three words more charged with history and meaning than James's seemingly platitudes and his empty language. So McGarren in a way has answered his own critique of ordinary language. James's use of language is charged with meaning. And I suppose the curious thing is that maybe it's the writer who picks up on this. I don't think James is even aware that he has got hello, hello, hello from this traumatic incident. So 
at the back of this is this argument about at what point does ordinary language, the language of everyday life, become, if you like, transfigured, if that's the word, into literary form? What, what makes ordinary language literary, particularly when writers excel at reproducing dialogue so faithfully that you think it's everyday life? So why isn't the dialogue literature if the writer is actually getting kudos for reproducing it? And I'm thinking of Joyce particularly, the mastery of everyday colloquial language. So why aren't they, why aren't the people in the pub in the Cyclops episode, why don't we call those people artists when it, all Joyce is doing is taking down their language? And it's kind of curious that at one point in Ulysses, Joyce reproduces a letter, alleged letter from Bloom's daughter, Millie, to Bloom. Millie is in Mullingar, that well-known metropolitan center. And in fact, there's a famous article called, what was Millie doing in Mullingar? And she's run off at a photographer and she writes to reassure her father that all is, all is splendid. And is swell is the word she uses. And the letter is reproduced in Ulysses. And if you picked it up on the train, or on the street, you throw it away as, a, as the most insignificant piece of writing. It's full of slightly ungrammatical errors. And if you like, a kind of, uh, actually, as McGarton said, bad writing. But when you read it in Ulysses, it cuts to the quick. It's a tour de force. It's the most moving, one of the most moving sections of Ulysses to read Millie's letter, even though there's nothing literary about it. So it really is an issue. What, what makes the same letter put into a literary work, literature, whereas if you took it out of the literary work and, and found it, and, you know, you would say this is of no interest whatsoever. As McGarrett would say, this is bad writing. So I think the whole complexity of what McGarrett is engaging with and which the, J James's episode brings up is this complicated relationship between everyday language and literary form. I mean, I'm showing a reproduction of the bicycle in the barracks. If you like, it is curious that a lot of the modernist turn in art around 100 years ago was represented by a famous installation by Duchamp in which he put a urinal into an art gallery and said, this is a work of art. And a bicycle wheel was another favorite example. And you're saying, what, how does it become a work of art? But in a curious way, what, what Tom and Morris and others have done with, with the barracks, they've taken a bicycle off the street and it, curiously it becomes of profound significance when you see it in the context of the barracks and you begin to see it in a totally different way. So in that sense, the resonances of everyday language and everyday objects are transformed by putting them into new, if you like, cultural or aesthetic or stylistic complex. It does matter that the room is designed in the way it is. The bicycle isn't lying on the wall outside. So McGarren's writing is raising these complicated issues. It's in this sense then coming towards the end that I want to bring in, if you like, the limits of local knowledge as shown by Jamesy. What this points to is a phrase of Nietzsche's, a wonderful phrase of Nietzsche's, the pathos of distance, that somehow along the lines of Seamus Heaney's phrase, Seamus Heaney has this phrase that sometimes you have to stand back to draw closer. that the writer stands outside or stands back and is an outsider. But that is actually to draw closer because if you're too close, you don't see the full picture. So a constant theme in McGarren's writing is to find we had to lose. The road away became the road back. By leaving a community, you actually 
often discover it. By being an outsider, you see things that insiders don't see. That's like the fish only discovering water when it was stranded on the beach. So in this sense, he says the journey out of that landscape became the return to those lands <coughs> and small farms and hedges and lakes under the Iron Mountains. It's almost as if you have to make the journey out to make the journey back. And that is <coughs> opening a space for the outsider or the newcomer to find a new home in this community. It even is brought out explicitly in the Damien Face Rising Sun. To see through the writer's eyes is already to step outside the locality, to view it afresh. So the writer shares something with the outsider, even though the writer is purveying local knowledge. The writer is at one remove, because otherwise you couldn't write. Like in heaven, you would have no need to write. So says McGarren, half strange or sometimes no more about a place than the people who live there. So, so this idea that, in fact, the outsider may have what might be called a suspecting glance or may have an insight that people who have a moat in their eye because of over familiarity uh, don't have. So I'm going to finish by showing one such stranger and commenting on her profound insights into the community and then open it up to contemporary literature. One such stranger, and I don't know if are people familiar with this remarkable book, Wayun Lee's book, Dear Friend from My Life, I Write to You in Your Life. <clears throat> this is a Chinese writer who had to leave the Republic of China in the aftermath of Tiananmen Square and the crackdowns, and who became so traumatized by her experience of having to leave home that she cannot write in the Chinese language. She writes in English. Again, I find that very hard. I mean, she says she cannot write fiction in the Chinese language or write literature. She probably can write letters, but she cannot write literature. But to find home again, she decides to go to Kutal, of all places, and arrives at the McGaffron Summer School to give a wonderful talk. But she says she comes to McGaffron to find something she had lost, to being in exile, and that is the feeling of home and belonging and attachment. And she walks the lanes and the, and the roads, and she says to, to actually be in the places that McGarren describes, she says, was almost an out-of-body experience. To recognize the path and the house and the story behind it, it was a closer to clarity I felt on that trip. Not just peace, but solidity, an unmistakable event for someone else's life had this unequivocal evidence. So she, she ends up in all places, the well-known literary establishment, Jim Henry's Bar in Coot Hall. And she writes about seeing these places and the restorative power of McGarren's fiction to, if you like, heal the wounds of her own sundered past. She says, homecoming in my place could only be meaningful, followed by leave-taking. I mean, that must be a reference to McGarren's book, The Leave-Taking. And then she says, an agitated mind does not know any road to peace except the one away from home, which time and again exposes one to the long phobia of attachment. She had seen attachment and belonging as a phobia. She was almost allergic to it. She was so traumatized by having to leave China. And then she comes to Kutal and to Ahawila and Karamaha, and she walks the roads of Leitra and Roskama. And she feels this restorative power. So it's a remarkable tribute, linking up that picture of McGarren in Tokyo with McGarren, not quite in China, but in fact restoring a sense of attachment to people who have been sundered from their past. And it's in this connection that I'll finish with contemporary Leitrim, the way Leitrim has become a home for refugees, particularly from the shattered Middle East, 
and the whole story of the Kurds of Carrick and Shannon and Leitrim is in fact almost what's opened up by McGarren's fiction. McGarren is almost opening a door for these people. Not that they necessarily have to read him, but I would imagine if they wanted to get, if you like, a kind of a concentrated experience of what it's like to read, read McGarren. And of course, people, this is a more famous character, Zach Baradi, who won a medal, a learning medal thing for Leitrim in the Laurie Maher Cup that you have a Kurdish refugee paying for Leitrim. And it's almost the ultimate homage to McGarren that Leitrim itself has become the home to the outsider. <clears throat> and I suppose the best testimony to this is the way in which the village of Kilti Clahar, <clears throat> which was about to be almost a ghost town, with the, with the post office closing, <coughs> the school closing, was suddenly rescued and, re and revived and resuscitated through the inflow of outsiders from all over the Middle East, South Africa. And all of a sudden, <coughs> the school is saved, the post office is saved. And I love that statue of Sean McDermott, the 1916 rising leader, looking down on a village that has been saved to internationalism. And that is a tribute, if you like, to McGarren's prose, which is speaking both to the local and to, and to the native. So it's McGarren, the most beautiful word for the other is thou. McGarren is almost in the most beautiful word in English, which is the word you, not the word I. The word other, not the word myself. And it's in this way, I just finish with this. He writes as if local experience and he must be thinking of the Rigna Mountains, the underground river, with the stains of the stains of iron in it, the Iron Mountains. And this is a sentence from the Day May Face the Rising Sun. They did not feel particularly quite or happy, but through them ran the sense, like an underground river, that the time would come when days would be looked back on as happiness, all that life would give up contentment and peace. So McGavin is saying, experience of everyday life is an underground river. And the writer is a diviner, <coughs> holding a divining rod. And now and again, it twitches and he brings, or she brings things to the surface. And what he brings to the, or she brings to the surface is not always welcomed by the locals. But in fact, it is, if you like, seeing yourself for the first time in a looking glass. So I leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh... Luke, um, uh, I know that you're not a storyteller, but having uh, listened to you on numerous occasions, the way you crafted that story on McGarren uh, was uh, a, a work of art. Um, and um, I'm just going to reflect on a couple of things before we go into the comments in the chat room. And uh, it, it is, um, you know, first of all, the imperative, the desire to speak the truth of our existence, not the truth about, but, but to try and capture the truth of our existence. And that that's almost at the, uh, it's at the heart of uh, uh, any kind of inquiry or, or philo philosophy or art. Um, and, but yet there is, there is never, the, the, um, uh, in setting out on that journey, it's always an approximation that you, uh, you, can, you can't, even when we're talking with each other, we are only developing approximate knowledge of what they meant to say, of what yeah. was lying beneath the surface, of what was really wanted to be saying. And that you know, McGarren um, uh, brings us there and he brings us to that world of experience, this kind of Proustian world of experience, world of uh, where everything that, as you said, that, uh, uh, that is important can't be said. Um, and, but then there is that, 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 that of, of how you get to that. And um, you said uh, when that wonderful phrase, like being a fish out of water, 
And this is a, a phrase that the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu uses and says that we live in a taken for granted world. Exactly. And um, the, the taken for granted world is uh, where things can't be said that need to be said uh, because they can't even be brought to consciousness. And so therefore you have to be a fish out of water, as you said. Uh, and the question is, is that, and this I'm coming, you might ask me, where am I going to get my question? But the question is that Joyce left and felt that the only way he could see back in was to become an exile. McGarren doesn't do that. He goes right back in. And, and you were afraid that that would be contaminate his, his ability to get closer, to approximate that truth. That, that is a very interesting comparison between Joyce and McGarren, who, in a sense, both shared the same. Try again in a few seconds. Okay, please move, move, move your phone, your phone, your mics, please. Oh, sorry, Luke. But that Joyce famously said that the best road to Tara is through Holly Head. <laughs> that the best way to Leitrim is through Paris, if you like. But but Joyce did not come back, as you say, whereas McGarren did. And in a sense, I think that is a very important elaboration on what I would call, for want of a better word again, knowledge of, that in a sense, McGarren does for the West of Ireland, what Joyce does for Dublin. And it's an interesting question whether a writer could develop that sense of attachment in the West of Ireland from a totally distant perspective. For McGarren, the return is part of it. For Joyce, it's a river of no return. And it is kind of interesting that one attachment, but having said that, as you probably people know, when Joyce was asked by Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, why did he not go back to Dublin if he loved us so much? And Joyce said, did, did I ever leave Dublin? You've got me wrong. I've never left Dublin. So while Joyce didn't go back to it in physically, he never left it psychologically. And in a sense, what McGarren is involved is probably completing that. But I think it's a really interesting point. Okay, let's, let, there's, there's a question or the, in the chat room. Um, you know, given that he, uh, you know, kind of not, not basically says, but that um, uh, there is a danger in conversation, in confession, in memoir, in, uh, uh, in, in self-expression, uh, that you're moving away from any truth. Um, um, but if that's the case, why do you think he was compelled to write memoir? That, that, that is an interesting question in relation to the fiction, because in some senses, it could be argued that harsh and all as the depiction of the father figure is in the fiction and particularly in the dark, but to a certain extent in the barracks and obviously amongst women, that the memoir is much harsher on the memory of the father. And it brings up the question that what is happening there is, is literary form every bit as present in the memoir. It is. The memoir is still a literary work. But it's interesting that it comes up against actuality. It comes up against what the philosopher Wittgenstein called the rough ground. It comes up against the rough ground of actuality. And at that point, the limits of artistic form are if you like, confronted with the harshness of the real. The, the reason I say it's, it's a work of literature, which of course it is, is that McGarren was a tremendous admirer of David Thompson's book, Woodbrook. 
which is written about the same locality in effect, but obviously from the position of, well, not the big house, the gentry house, Woodbrook. But it's hard to know what Thompson's book is. Is it a memoir? Is it social history? Is it a Proustian kind of act of self-revelation? Well, certainly the memoir comes, if the memoir is raised to the level of form, another version would be Seamus Dean's Reading in the Dark, which some people call a novel, other call a memoir. And Dean deliberately blurred the distinction between them for precisely the reason we're talking about. So it does show that notwithstanding his strictures against memoirs and diaries and what he would almost say self-indulgence, Actually, he, he, according as the memoir or the diary or the journal, I mean, the most famous example is Keats's letters. So if Keats had, had written no poetry, his letters would be masterpieces. <laughs> so th there is this, I mean, McGarren is right to say, you know, we have to have a double take on it, but he, it's not quite accurate to say that everyday writing cannot last forever. Indeed, as Keats did say, I think a beauty is a joy forever. Okay, just to kind of uh, another question or came up in the chat room um, about you know the, the, the almost the you know whereas place is honoured uh, in in the writings, um, people are shamed, uh, and and that it, it was kind of a, a collateral damage. In, in trying to capture the truth of the place, of, of, of the people, um, that stories would be told. Uh, uh, and as you said at the beginning, in, in relation to the, the first edition of the barracks. Um, and uh, there is a, a sense of, of you know, that, that idea of with his you know, razor sharp pen, he, he destroyed the lives of the local people. But then, uh, there seems to be um, a, a kind of a veneration, a, a eulogy almost, uh, that is produced in that they may face the rising sun. And, and I'm just wondering, is that, that uh, uh, was there some kind of epiphany whereby he, in, in, instead of trying to, to tell the harsh truth, as you said, that there was a deliberate attempt uh, to soften uh, and produce a, 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 um, a, a kind of a more nostalgic um, view uh, of the people. No, I mean, there is definitely a very nuanced and complicated moral issue about what some people saw as character assassination of people in the locality and no doubt the alibi of fiction is vital for that. And that's why I suppose fiction allows this distance, this one remove. Even if you're exposing the issues, the names, we used to, used to be a detective thing on television, Dragnet years ago, the names are changed to protect the innocent. In McGarren's case, it was the names are changed to protect the guilty. <laughs> and in, in a sense, the alibi of fiction kind of does that but of course people like my aunt and my mother were looking for the key to the code and we're trying to read through the alibi of fiction to to see who was behind all this but nonetheless I mean some people are very hurt by it and there definitely were I mean the alibi of fiction wasn't strong to crop um, the way some people felt very wounded but if you like, the, they may face the rising sun. In a, in a way, it does represent almost a version of what is going on in the fiction. And it has to do with, which I would have in the longer version of what I was presenting, the difference between local knowledge, local rumour and gossip and the damage limitation that's done by containing it within a community. Damaging and all as it may be, to one extent within a community, but it's still not public knowledge in the sense of journalism. 
the mass media. It, it, it's not, if you like, to the world at large. So that th there's a whole <coughs> complex version of how rumor and knowledge are contained within communities through, through checks and balances of control of communities. But what's dangerous <coughs> with new social media is that those, those boundaries are gone and, and those kind of controls on gossip and rumor are gone and everything is open season which is why such damaging fake news and false knowledge is uncontrolled. So what they may face the rising sun is a powerful, is a powerful affirmation of the way knowledge can circulate in the community and, and be kind of contained is the wrong word, but be to and fro of how low people who are I suppose close to the texture of everyday life can take and can make their own judgments about this kind of inner knowledge. Um, Whereas <coughs> once, it goes on social, once it goes on social media, and McGarren's equivalent would be journalism, the, the, the breaching of intimacy and the breaching of boundaries by journalists kind of <coughs> seizing on a local issue to make a public exposure of it in the interest allegedly of if you like the public service actually the government say priest and titillation and sensationalism so in in a sense mm -hmm. demifix rising sun is almost a, a powerful i think protest against a world that was just coming on board at that time and that is social media because the kind of knowledge in a demi face the rising sun is exactly what you won't get on Facebook or what you won't get on Tinder or the likes or Twitter. Um, my, that's not to say Facebook and those don't have their powerful uses in local knowledge. There's definitely a, a kind of a, the, the fine grain of everyday life is measured in a way that few Irish novels have achieved so far. I think that's a, a wonderful way. We are, uh, a, a, whether it's a kind of a, a, a self-imposed rigor, but we do keep to the hour. Um, and uh, I want to thank you sincerely uh, for a, a wonderful um, insight. Uh, and I just talking personally, I mean, since having come to live here, um, um, I have used McGarren as a way to understand uh, not only the local people, um, and local places, but also, uh, I think, the meaning of life. Uh, Luke, thank you very, very much. Thank well, you for everybody for participating once again. But I thank uh, all the people for taking time off on a Tuesday evening. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'll <laughs> take time down. off to be with you again. Anyway, this uh, uh, Just if you haven't been to the barracks, uh, please come. Uh, we'll be open in March. Uh, and I'll uh, bring my key to Thank you very much, indeed, everybody. Thank you very much, particularly, Luke. Good night. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.